Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the Great Controversy. That sounds like a big battle or a big war or something, doesn't it? This particular lesson is a very interesting one entitled Light from the Sanctuary. And this is lesson number eight in that series for May 25 of 2024. What's a war doing in a sanctuary? Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, help us to understand these key events in the history of this great controversy. Help us to understand how the sanctuary story comes to, into play and what it means for us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It has been esti estimated in the more than 100,000 people, so that's a, a conservative estimate, believed and followed the teachings of William Miller. When October 22, 1844, which is the date, do you remember how they arrived at October 22? Yeah. It was the, it was the time of the festival. The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. For Jews in 1844. Passed and Jesus did not arrive. There was a terrible disappointment. Many gave up their beliefs. Some of the believers looked again at the scriptures and realized that there are two sanctuaries discussed in detail in the Old and New Testaments. So if we're talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary and now there are two, which one is gonna be cleansed? They began to accept the idea that the prophecy of 2300 days, years, applies to Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary and not to anything on this earth. Oh boy, gotta change your story here. There we go. Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, so prominent is the theme of the sanctuary in both the Old and New Testaments that it is simply astonishing to consider that many Christians lost sight of the doctrine of the heavenly sanctuary for, sanctuary for almost two millennia. Seventh-day Adventists realized that the doctrine of the heavenly sanctuary was not only an important biblical teaching, but was the central tenet of the biblical theology that connected the other doctrines. These teachings included, include the doctrine of God, his character, creation, work, and government. So what is it, we're gonna, one of the things we need to think about is, okay, how does what we know about the sanctuary impact these ideas? Go ahead. The doctrine of the origin of the evil and the great controversy, the doctrine of Christ, his first coming to earth, his incarnation, his life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension, the doctrine of salvation in Christ, the doctrine of the last things, the second coming of Christ, the final judgment and the restoration of all things, and the doctrine of the church, especially the teaching of the remnant church in the end time before the second coming of Jesus from the Bible study guide. Okay, now, do you think if I gave you a Bible and a little bit of extra help, you could explain how the sanctuary fits each one of those things? That's a good Adventist message. I need that in high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yes. I hope we would do better than that. Okay, Charles. Yes, sir. The longest biblical prophecy, the 2300 years of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, concerns the heavenly sanctuary and the great controversy. This prophecy acquaints us with both the attack on the heavenly sanctuary and its cleansing in the day of God's judgment and in the restoration of all things. However, Adventists do not think that the prophecy as a mere abstraction with no basis or fulfillment in reality. Rather, they understand that this prophecy was fulfilled in history commencing in the mid 19th century in 1844. The fulfillment of this prophecy calls for all people living in this probationary times to accept Jesus' atonement for their sins before the close of his intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Okay, so we're gonna, there's gonna be some final events in this earth's history. There's going to be the closing of probation and all that that implies. And then there's gonna be a second coming. A careful look at Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 caused them to see that Daniel 7 ends with a judgment in heaven. And Daniel 8 ends with 
the cleansing of the sanctuary. So you follow them down, they're, they're parallel, boom, boom, there's Rome and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome and so forth, I mean Babylon, there at the beginning. And then it's these two things at the end. Otherwise, these two chapters are parallel. So where do we get the idea that there's more than one sanctuary? Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9 and then 40. So the people must make a sacred tent for me so that I may live among them make it and all of its furnishings according to the plan that I will show you. Jumping to verse 40, take care to make them according to the plan that I showed you on the mountain uh, from Good News Bible. Okay, so there was a specific plan shown to whom? Moses. Moses, Moses okay. Then Hebrews 8, 1 through 6, the whole point of what we are saying is that we have such a high priest who sits at the right of the throne of the divine majesty in heaven. He serves as high priest in the ho most holy place, that is, in the real tent which was put up by the Lord, not by human hands. <clears throat> the work they do as priests is really only a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. It is the same as it was with Moses. When he was about to build the sacred tent, God said to him, be sure to make everything according to the pattern you were shown on the mountain. But now Jesus has been given priestly work that is superior, which is superior to theirs, just as the covenant which he arranged between God and his people is a better one because it is based on promises of better things from the Good News Bible. Okay, so what, do you, what happened as a result of all that stuff? As we read, we talked about last week, the crisis that happened in 1844, and then what happened, Myra? From the Bible study guide. As the early Adventist believers poured over the scriptures in the months following 1844, they understood that there were two sanctuaries mentioned in the Bible, the one that Moses built and the great original in heaven. The term sanctuary is used in the Bible, as used in the Bible, refers first to the tabernacle built by Moses as a pattern or type of, hev of heavenly things. And second, the true tabernacle in heaven to which the earthly sanctuary pointed. At the death of Christ, the typical service lost its importance. The true tabernacle in heaven is the sanctuary of the new covenant. And as the prophecy of Daniel 8.14 is fulfilled in this era, the sanctuary to which it refers must be the sanctuary of the new covenant. So it's a little hard to talk about the cleansing of a sanctuary, which is completely gone now. Yeah. It's been destroyed. And you know what? Do you know what they did with the money they took away from Jerusalem? They built the Colosseum. They built the Colosseum in Rome. Didn't know that. Hmm. Did Dan they? Yeah. And where they tortured Christians and yeah. Jews. Yes. Burned them and yeah. fed them to the lions and things. Yeah. Daniel 8, 14. Now here's the critical verse. And he said to me, 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Okay, that's the literal wording. Well, another way you can say it is if you're setting its rightful, to its rightful state. Yeah, there's other, other ways to translate so, that, yeah. From the writings of Ellen G. White. Gordon, Jim? At the termination of the 2300 days in 1844, there had been no sanctuary on earth for many centuries. Thus, the prophecy, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, unquestionably points to the sanctuary in heaven. Great okay. Controversy, page 417. The earthly sanctuary was completely <laughs> built around the sacrifice of animals. It, that was the whole, seemed, looked like, seemed like the whole purpose. There will be no animal sacrifices in heaven. While Jesus is the Lamb of God, we, we accept that terminology, there is no way that he will be sacrificed again. So what would be the purpose of having a sanctuary plan like that for the sacrifice of animals in heaven? The judgment of God is an absolutely essential aspect of Christian beliefs. See if we can figure these, put this all together. How much do we know about the judgment and how it takes place? Look at Zechariah 3, verse 1 to 5. We'll read, read that in a few moments to see how the judgment works and how Jesus intercedes for us. 
It is not the Father who is accusing us. Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. Now just quickly, because we're going to run across this terminology later on, those filthy clothes, what do they represent? Sins. His sins, okay? This Joshua was high priest after the Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that there, this is not the Joshua that worked with Moses. This is many, many years later. Go ahead. Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is no condemnation now for those who live, on, live in the union with Jesus Christ. For the law of the Spirit, which brings us life union in union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending His own Son, who came into the nature, with he a came nature. with a nature like sinful man, human nature to do away with sin. So what did he come for? To do, to away, do with away with sin. sin. Go ahead. God did this so that the righteous demands of the law might be fulfilled, might be fully satisfied in us who live according to the spirit and not according to the human nature. Remember that Satan had claimed that this earth was his domain and that, not, that no human being could live on this earth without sinning. So he was sure that who would he get to sin? Jesus. Jesus. Up to that point in human history, it seemed that Satan was right. Jesus proved him wrong. Satan then claimed that Jesus was not an ordinary human being and God has, had, has promised that at the end of time, a group of ordinary people will live sinless lives just before he comes to take them back to heaven. Satan will be proven wrong once again for the last time. And that group of people is called 144,000? That's correct. It is absolutely essential that we remember that while our cases are being discussed in heaven, Satan is accusing us day and night. So it's not, okay, there's a bunch of books there that we're looking at. This is live accusations. Christ provides our salvation by answering and refuting Satan's constant charges against us. God gave the children of Israel a special schedule for their activities each year. They, they, they called it a, a biblical year or a, a, a sacred year. A part of that schedule was the Day of Atonement, when all sin was to be erased and they were given a fresh start for the new year. And there's big, long discussions of this in Leviticus 16 and 23, but we're going to just read a few verses from that. Verse 21 from Leviticus 16, <laughs> He shall put both his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the evils, sins, and rebellions of the people of Israel, and so transfer them to the goat's head. Then the goat is to be driven off into the desert by someone appointed to do it. Jumping to verse 29, the following regulations are to be observed for all time to come. On the 10th day of the seventh month, the Israelites and the foreigners living among them must fast and must do and must not do any work. The priest properly ordained and consecrated to succeed his father is to perform the ritual of purification. He shall put on the priestly garments and perform the ritual to purify the most holy place the rest of the tent of the Lord's presence, 
the altar, the priests, and all the, all the people of the community. So Moses did as the Lord had commanded. So if we had time to read the whole section here, you'll realize there's an elaborate cleansing process, an elaborate process of everybody uh, trying to confess their sins and, and fasting is a part of that confession. An elaborate process to prepare for this and then an elaborate process for the cleansing of the people who dealt with the sins were the high priest and this person who was supposed to carry the sins out in the desert on the head of the scapegoat. So both of them had to go through another elaborate cleansing process at the end because they had dealt with sin. Figuratively. Okay, but we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> Thus the entire... Literally. Yeah. Thus the entire camp of Israel was pronounced sin-free. God would no longer count their sins against them. Okay, where do we get that information from? Myra? Hebrews 10, 17, and 18. And then he says, I will not remember their sins and evil deeds any longer. So when these have, these have been forgiven, an offering to take away sins is no longer needed. Good News Bible. Okay, so Hebrews 10, 17, if you're very familiar with that, where does it come from? This is a direct quote from yes. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and it's also quoted in Hebrews 8 as well. Okay, you want to go ahead with yeah. Hebrews, Hebrews 9 there? Hebrews 9, 23 to 28. Those things which are copies of the heavenly originals had to be purified in that way. Those things. Yeah. Well, I was talking about this. Really, it's talking about the, the temple, the 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 holy place, the most holy place, the offering. In other words, the All priest was supposedly ceremonially, ritualistically, we might even add, was cleansing the whole sanctuary. The children of Israel had gone up there, they had offered their sacrifices, they had confessed their sins, and those sins were in, in ceremony, transferred to the temple. Then now at the end, those sins were put, taken out of the temple, put on the head of the scapegoat, and he was taken out. So you could see, even a child could say, oh, so my sins went there, and they went into the temple. Then the high priest picked up those sins, and he took them and put on the head of the scapegoat, and the scapegoat went there. So God has taken care of my sins. Now this is a very, we'll get into the details. This is a very concrete way of putting things, yeah. That Hebrews 10, 17 and 18 there, it says forgiven, and the word is not forgiven. It's a, a better way. It would be remission. Remission has to do with the disease. You, you, it has to do with healing. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to say it's forgiveness, uh, it's a distortion of, of, of truth. Well, we've distorted the meaning of forgiven. <laughs> well, forgiven <laughs> is, is, is not part of the equation. Mm -hmm. it, it's a false concept that, that people are being left with. <clears throat> okay, Myra. Continuing on with uh, verse 23. But the heavenly things themselves require much better sacrifices. For Christ did not go into the holy place made by human hands, which is a copy of the real one. He went to, into heaven itself, and where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. The Jewish high priest goes into the most holy place every year, with the blood of an animal, but Christ did not go to in to offer himself, but Christ did not go in to offer himself many times, for then he would have had <laughs> to suffer many times ever since the creation of the world. Instead, now, when all ages of time are nearing the end, he has appeared once and for all to remove sin through the sacrifice of himself. Everyone must die once, and after that, be judged by God. In the same manner, Christ also offers in sacrifice once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are waiting for him. Have you ever asked yourself if Caiaphas did this whole ceremony just before Jesus was well? basically while Jesus was in the grave. Yeah. Did he do that? 
A careful reading of Leviticus 16 shows that there was an elaborate and very careful ceremony connected with the Day of Atonement. The children of Israel had been bringing their sin offerings to the gate of the tabernacle all year long. Their sins were ceremonially transferred to the tabernacle. Then on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, after going through an elaborate <coughs> cleansing ceremony, carried those sins ceremonially out of the tabernacle and placed them on the head of the goat chosen for Azazel. That goat was led by a chosen man far away, never to return to the camp. Both the high priest and the one who took the scapegoat away had to cleanse themselves with a careful bath after the day of a day's activities. This was to indicate that the camp had been purified from sin. So what does it mean to be ritually clean? So no one sinned that day. Re well, <laughs> that's, that's a good true. question. <laughs> that's not, but we read up here, what does that mean? It means God said, if you do this, then I will count your sins as being gone. There's nothing wrong with God's memory. He remembers perfectly well these things. But he says, if you do this, the agreement is, I will no longer count those sins against you. Okay? Let us be clear. There is nothing wrong with God's memory. He remembers everything we have done, but he chooses not to think about our sins after they have been forgiven. And here we have another comment. Satan has an accurate knowledge of the sins that he has tempted God's people to commit. And he urges his accusations against them, declaring that they by their sins have been forfeiting, have forfeited divine protection and claim that he has the right to destroy them. So what is Satan doing right now? Don't just all look at me like that. <laughs> what is Satan doing right now? Well, I could not defeat you, but I'll make sure that I can take as many away from you as I can. That's what he's doing. Satan is proclaiming our sins, not necessarily one of us, but he's claiming the sins, particularly of God's righteous people, right there before the heavenly universe and saying, these people should they're be, mine. they're mine. They, right. they should be abandoned to me. Right. That's happening right now. They're beyond hope. He, <laughs> he hopes, he hopes. Okay. Well, one quick question. Mm -hmm. After Genesis 3.15, mm -hmm. did folk in the Old Testament really understand what this, system was all about. Did they make it salvation itself or were they really looking forward? Because I, it's I, very clear in Genesis 3.15. I think they recognized that God was going to do something, but that's about as much as they knew. They didn't, they, of course, they had no idea about a sanctuary and state goats and that kind of stuff. They, of course, they, they knew about lambs being sacrificed. Right. We knew that. But um, the rest but, of that. But the promise was so clear in Genesis 3.15. Yeah. So clear. As I said, they knew that God promised he was going to do something. Right. Yeah. Okay. Satan claims that he has a right to destroy God's people. He pronounces them just as deserving as himself, an exclusion from the fever, from, sorry, from the favor of God. By the way, to re remind you, these are words from Ellen White. Are these, he says, the people who are to take my place in heaven and the place of the angels who united with me? They profess to obey the law of God, but they have kept, but have they kept its precepts? Have they not been lovers of self more than lovers of God? Now, none of these things could apply to any of us, right? Mm -hmm. Have they not placed their own interests above his services, his service? Have they not loved the things of the world? Oh dear. Look at the sins that have marked their lives. Behold their selfishness, their malice, their hatred of one another. Will God banish me and my angels from his presence and yet reward those who have been guilty of the same sins? I mean, he's got a pretty solid argument there, isn't he? Satan's saying, you're going to take these people yep. over me? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thou canst not do this, O Lord, in justice. Justice. Who's asking for justice? Satan. 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 Justice demands that sentence be pronounced against him. not not justice for himself, but for justice for these other people. Yeah. But while the company. Yeah. 
Ellen Wright goes on, while the followers of Christ have sinned, they have not given themselves up to be controlled by the satanic agencies. They have re repented of their sins and have sought the Lord in humility and contrition. And the divine advocate pleads in their behalf. Remember Zechariah 3. He who has been most abused by their ingratitude, who knows their sin and also their penitence, declares, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. I gave my life for these souls. They are graven upon the palms of my hands. They may have imperfections of character. They may have failed in their endeavors, but they have repented, and I have forgiven and accepted them. The assaults of Satan are strong. Ellen White goes on. His delusions are subtle, but the Lord's eye is upon his people. Their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them, but Jesus will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. Their early earthliness will be removed, that through them the image of Christ may be perfectly revealed. Prophets of Kings 588, 589. And that's part of a chapter that gives a lot of very great details about this whole question. It's a, it's a beautiful picture. Yeah. However, Satan has distorted the uh, salvation process in such a way that uh, uh, if you're saved once, you cannot be unsaved. Yeah. Even the Heavenly Father himself cannot unsave you. Some people try to claim that, yes. No, it's not some people, the whole Christian world. Yeah. They don't understand yeah. Ezekiel 18, which is so simple. Don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> The it's people were told that these annual rituals were to be performed to take away their sins. Anyone who did not comply with all the requirements was to be cut off and to no longer be a part of God's chosen people. These ceremonies were a very concrete way of presenting to an ignorant, recently enslaved people the ideas that their sins that they confessed at the tent sanctuary would be ceremonially transferred to the zazel goat and carried far away that was to represent that god will forgive them and no longer hold those sins against them that was a very concrete and simple way but you you could understand it what is the significance of understanding the details of the day of atonement in our day we don't have any of that kind of stuff going on anymore why do we need to do, have all that? Does it still have any meaning for us? Zechariah 3, which we have read above, tells us about the main participants in the judgment scene. Who is it? Satan, what's he doing? Accusing. 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 What is Christ doing? Well, defending, if you will. The Father is judging over the whole process. And who else is watching? The entire universe. Okay. Let's see, Satan is accusing us and Jesus Christ is defending us. It is important also to recognize that this is a process which is very important to the beings in the rest of the universe because God plans to bring some of us former sinners to live with them for the rest of eternity. They do not want another rebellion in heaven. Daniel 7, 9 and 10 tell us about the rest of the participants of the judgment process. The entire universe is watching how God will deal with us as represented by Joshua, the high priest. Jim? Daniel 7, 9, uh, verses 9 to 10. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. Good News Bible. <clears throat> oh, what do we know, what more do we know about the judgment, uh, th how the judgment takes place? Myra, I think I jumped over you. Would you read that, Joan? Th Gordon, I'm sorry, it was you. Yeah. Or was it Charles? Yeah. yeah, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, John chapter 3, verse 17 to 21. For God did not send his son into the world to be its, to be its judge, but to be its savior. Those who believe in the son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in the only, is God's only son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light 
because their deeds are evil. Oh dear. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. Wow, from the Good News Bible. Yes. The most amazing thing about the judgment is to realize that it is not God who arbitrarily makes the decisions about his children. Each of us will, in essence, judge ourselves. Gordon? Ellen White in Great Controversy says, could those whose lives have been spent in rebellion against God be suddenly transported to heaven and witness the high, the holy state of perfection that ever exists there? Every soul filled with love, every countenance beaming with joy, enrapturing music in melodious strains rising in honor of God and the Lamb, and ceaseless streams of light flowing from the redeemed, from the face of him who sitteth upon the throne. <clears throat> Could those whose hearts are filled with hatred of God, of truth and holiness, mingle with the heavenly throng and join their songs of praise? That's a question, mm. a long question. Could they endure the glory of God and the Lamb? No, no, she says. Years of probation were granted them that they might form characters for heaven, but they have never trained the mind to love purity. They have never learned the language of heaven, and now it is too late. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. What? She uses the word, heaven would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They would long to flee from that holy place. They would long to flee from heaven? Is yes. That what she's they would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Ellen White, Great Controversy, 542, paragraph two. Okay, so if you took the wicked to heaven, it would be hell for them. Isn't that what it says? Yes. Be what yes. people think of as hell. Wow, okay. What verse in the Bible sort of go, a couple of verses sort of goes along with that? Uh, Revelation 22, verses 10 to 12. And he said to me, do not keep the prophetic words of this book secret because the time is near when all this will happen. Whosoever is evil must go on doing evil and whoever, whosoever is filthy must go on being filthy and whosoever is good must go on doing good and whosoever is holy must go on being holy. Listen, says Jesus, I'm coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me to give to each one according to what he has done. So it sounds like we sort of do it for ourselves, don't we? Yeah, Bible self-selected. Mm -hmm. Bible study guide says, since Christ <laughs> comes to give out his final rewards, there must be a judgment before that to show the, who, who will receive the, what reward when he comes. When Christ returns, there is no second chance. Every human being has had sub significant, sufficient. Yeah, there we go. Sufficient information to make their final, irrevocable decision for or against Christ. We get to choose whose side we're going to be on. Yes. It has been suggested that the close of probation might come secretly and unexpectedly to many people. There is some truth to that idea, but notice these words. When the work of investigation shall be ended, when this the case... This is from Ellen White. This is from Ellen White, I'm sorry, yes. When the work of investigation shall be ended, when the cases of those who in all ages have professed to be followers of Christ have been examined and decided, then and not till then, probation will close and the door of mercy will be shut. So in other words, who ends up finally finishing the everything so that probation can close? We. We are the ones who have to make the decisions. God will not come until we have made up our decisions. 
Thus, in the one short sentence, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. We are carried down through the Savior's final ministration to the time when the great work of, for man's salvation shall be completed. Great Controversy 428, paragraph 2. So to the righteous, those who are friends of Christ, the judgment will be a time of reward and rejoicing. And these are passages that talk about that. And our Bible study guide sort of summarizes those passages. You want to read that, Jim? <clears throat> Paul's here. Excuse me. Paul's point here in Hebrews is hold fast. Come boldly. Never give up. Focus your faith on Jesus, our great high priest. In Jesus, we have all we need. F by faith, we enter into the heavenly sanctuary through the new and living way that Jesus has opened for us from the Bible study guide. <clears throat> Many think that God the Father is a just judge who is looking for an opportunity to condemn them. They would believe that if Jesus were not pleading for us, the Father could not forgive us. This is paganism. Charles? Yes. God the Father, if, okay, had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, really, veiling his glory and humbling himself, that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Jesus would not have been changed. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. This is from Ellen White, letter 83, 1895. Okay. So what, we're, what he's saying, what she's saying here is that when we see Christ here on this earth, in effect, we are seeing the Father. The new covenant is spelled out precisely in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Gordon? From the Good News Bible, the Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. What was, problem, what was the problem with that old covenant? Do you remember? God gave those commandments from Mount Sinai and the people said, what? We will do it. All the God has said we will do. And how long did that last? <laughs> Not days. Milliseconds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the problem with the first covenant was we did the promising and we failed. Okay, go ahead. Although I was like... Yeah. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put... Now who's doing the action? God is doing the action. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts, God says. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. But there's nothing wrong with God's memory. Yeah. I, the Lord, have spoken. What he's saying is I won't hold it against them anymore. Right. And that promise is repeated in Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10. So apparently Paul at least thought it was pretty important. If God were not the loving, forgiving person that we know he is, our cases would be hopeless. Our record is sinful. It cannot be changed. It is a part of the permanent record of history. But as we live in the cooperation with God, our lives can be changed, and God will choose to ignore our evil past. It is clear that the ancient ceremonial rituals did not permanently remove the sins of people. Otherwise, they would not have had to come back every year or even more often to offer their lambs. But as he promised in Jeremiah 31, 34, for those who come back to him and choose to follow his ways, their sins no longer matter because they have been forgiven and their lives have changed. This is the explanation of what happens when God <clears throat> forgives. This is not some legal transaction happening in some book somewhere. God simply says that those old sins do not matter anymore because they no longer correctly represent my children. Their lives are being changed day by day. 
They are safe to admit to the heavenly kingdom. They will not start the great controversy all over again. We are given a clear choice by looking at the life and death of Jesus. If we are willing to follow his example as careful as possible, uh, we can live with him forever. But if we choose our own way, then we will die the kind of death he died, separated from his father, who is the only source of life, never having, uh, having made that clear. What do we? Romans, Romans 3, 8, 3. Says, what the law could not do because human nature, it was weak, God did. So let me interrupt there for a second. What does it mean to say the law could not do? means that we, trying to observe the law, can't do it. Can't do it. Okay, go ahead. He condemned... God did, okay. But you yeah. can't, people can't, can listen. Yeah. That's, that's the yeah. most important thing for people yeah. to do is listen. Go ahead. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son, who came by a nature like sinful, who came with a nature like sinful human nature, to do away with sin. Good okay. Advice. He came to do what? To do away, to with, do away sin. with sin. How does the life and death of Christ do away with sin? Education. Okay. He shows us exactly what it does to people. Mm -hmm. And we have a choice. We can live a life like his life as far as possible, following his example, or... We can choose our own way, the selfish way, Satan's way, separate ourselves from God, and we will die. Or if we allow him to live his life in us, yeah. then he keeps his own law in us. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hebrews 9, 28 says, In the same manner Christ also was offered in sacrifice once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to give those who... But to save those. But to save those who are waiting for him. Okay, so he came the first time to do away with sin, and now he's coming to reward those who have learned the lesson. Yes, listened. Hmm? Who listened. Those yeah, who listened. listened and learned. Yeah. Ellen White, the intercession of Christ on man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, he began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. We must, by faith, enter within the veil. Now, who, who's, who is it that's supposed to enter in the veil? Only the high priest. Only the high priest. So what are we doing in there? Christ has entered there on our behalf, and we're supposed to follow him. There the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. There we may gain a clear insight into the mysteries of redemption. The salvation of man is accomplished at an infinite expense to heaven. The sacrifice made is equal to the broadest demands of the broken law of God. Jesus has opened the way to the Father's throne and through his mediation, the sincere desire of all who come to him in faith may be presented before God. Great controversy again, 489 paragraph 1. So, Jim, how does Christ's death? How does Christ's death on the cross relate to his intercession in the heavenly sanctuary? And why is the judgment so necessary to the plan of salvation from the Bible study guide? <clears throat> there isn't any immediate obvious, unless you know what's going on behind the scene, any immediate obvious thing between Christ dying on a, on a cross and what's going on in the heavenly sanctuary, unless you know the story behind it. So consider the following words from Ellen White about the judgment. Jesus does not excuse their sins, but shows their penitence and faith and claiming for themselves forgiveness. He lifts his wounded hand before the Father and the holy angels saying, I know them by name. Okay, I'm going to stop, inter interrupt just a second. Okay. In this scene, who is participating? Jesus. But who's the first one who, who takes action? Penitent. Well, Sinner. before that. Before that. Satan is the one who's accusing us. Right, yes. right there. Satan is accusing us. Jesus responds 
responds, and who's watching? The universe. The Father and the holy angels. Okay? So Jesus, what does Jesus say now, going ahead? Saying, I know them by name. I have give, graven them on the palms of my hands. The sacrifices of God are a broken, broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalms 51, 17. And to the accuser of his people, he declares, Lord, rebuke you, O Satan. Even the Lord that had chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. So, Satan, formerly known as Lucifer, had been the leader of the angels, right? Yes. And now what's Jesus saying about him in front of all the angels? The Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you because of what you're trying to do, right? Yes. So let's be clear that the roles have completely changed. Okay, Gordon? From Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church. The fact that the knowledge, that the fact that the acknowledged people of God are represented as standing before the Lord in filthy garments should lead to humility and deep search of heart on the part of all who profess his name. How so, many would that be? Anybody here for, <laughs> chooses to be a Christian? All. Okay, go ahead. Those who are indeed purifying their souls by obeying the truth will have a most humble opinion of themselves. The more closely they view the spotless character of Christ, the stronger will be their desire to be conformed to his image, and the less will they see of purity or holiness in themselves. But while we should realize our sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make us if make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but on his own. Again, Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. Okay, try to imagine Satan accusing us, and Jesus says, no, those sins don't apply to that person anymore. He has followed me, and I died for him. See these marks on my hands? And he's changed. That person yeah, has changed. That person has changed. And there, God the Father and the Son are the only ones who can choose to ignore our past sins. How do we know that? Even the Pharisees knew that. What did they say? Only, only God, God can forgive sins. sins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, Myra? The, the Bible study guide says, the fulfillment of the 2300-day prophecy is especially important to Adventists because they understand that God has called them as his remnant church to announce to the world the fulfillment of this prophecy. The return of Jesus, the imminent consumption, consummation. consummation of the great controversy. Thus, the message of the 2300-day prophecy is the very essence of the eternal gospel, Revelation 14, 6. So why would that be true? Let's think about that for a minute. God said he would do it. Jesus did it. And now he's coming to reward the people who take advantage of it, right? Go ahead. The good news in the... In, the good news in the context of the three angels' messages is God's final call of love to humanity. God bids sinners on earth to turn to him so that they may be saved by the blood of Jesus and by his mediation in the heavenly sanctuary. As we know, the first coming of Jesus as a baby boy was almost unrecognized by human beings. We have a brief account of Luke 2, 25-38, that a man named Simeon and a woman named Anna recognized Jesus when he was taken to his dedication. This is proof that Jesus complied with the requirements of the law at the sanctuary. So what happened to him at the sanctuary? He was circumcised. He was dedicated. They, yeah. brought, it, they brought gifts. He was dedicated and he was circumcised. Yes. On the eighth day. On the eighth day. This was proof that Jesus complied. Seventh-day Adventists have come to believe that we are in the antitypical Day of Atonement. 
just as the children of Israel were supposed to cleanse themselves and prepare very carefully for that end of year exercise, we are to prepare ourselves for the end of human history. Which do you think is more serious, preparing for the Day of Atonement back then or preparing for the end of human history now? <laughs> <laughs> we're glad to be here. <laughs> yes. Okay. Daniel prayed for God's intervention to fulfill Jeremiah's 70-year prophecy, pleading with the Most High to redeem his people, Daniel 3, 9 through 17, and uh, 3 through 19, I'm sorry. And if you want to read the story about an absolutely incredible intercessory prayer, that's it, maybe the greatest in the entire Bible. And he, go, and he prays to let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary, Daniel 9, 17. To Daniel's joy, God sent the man Gabriel to instruct him. Is Gabriel a man? Hmm. However, Gabriel did not immediately focus on answering Daniel's prayer. So about this Jeremiah's 70 year prophecy. So Daniel, and I, I, I've asked myself several questions about that whole situation. Did Daniel, you know, obviously he was a very important man, had access to a lot of money probably. Did he have copies of all the scrolls of the Old Testament? Hmm? At least he apparently knew about Jeremiah's. He may have memorized them. That's also possible. So now he's pleading, Lord, the seven years is just about over. Are you going to do something? It doesn't look like you're going to do anything. Instead, Gabriel began to exhort Daniel to pay attention to the message and gain the understanding of the vision. Obviously, the vision in question is the one described in Daniel 8, 14, because Gabriel does not speak of 70 literal weeks, but of 70 prophetic weeks, or 490 years. The 490 years could be determined or determined or deducted only or cut off from the 2,300 years in Daniel's vision of Daniel 8, 14. Not from the seven years in Jeremiah's prophecy. By this calculation, Gabriel also revealed the event that marked the beginning of the 70 prophetic years and therefore of the 2,300 years. So remember, just, just to review that very quickly, in Daniel 7, verse 18, what did our executives tell? He had gave he gave uh, Ezra a letter, and what did the letter say? Please buy lambs and bullocks and all this stuff and perfume and oil and wine and so forth and offer these things to your God for me, praying for me and my son. And if you have any money left over, what do you do with it? Do whatever you think is appropriate. Whatever you think is appropriate for the people who live in Jerusalem. According to the will of your God. Yep, exactly. So what did they do? They started repairing the wall. This event was the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel 9, 25, and the, it quoted in Ezra 7, 18, which took place in 457 BC. And the way that's all calculated is amazing. You want to look in the SDA Bible commentary, how they came up with that, 457. Thus, the prophecy of the 70 prophetic weeks is a subset or the first part of the 2300 years prophecy. The two periods constitute one great prophecy. What do we mean when we say that? Why are they two part of one? They start at the same time. They start at the same time. If you cut something off, you either have to cut it off from the beginning or you have to cut it off from the end. You can't cut it off from the middle, can you? You're not cutting it off, you're cutting it out if you take it from the middle. So they concluded, yeah, this is cutting off from the beginning. And what's cut off from the beginning? 190 years. And what was that for? Be given to the people. The so time they, designated for the for, Jewish people. Okay. But they didn't, do, they didn't do much of anything with that time. No. Mm. So in Daniel 9, 7, we find Daniel praying earnestly and fasting to try to understand the information that had been given. Uh, he recognized that the children of Israel had been evil and sinful and had not held up their side of the covenant. They had agreed, uh, with, agreed to with God. And remember, we already talked about that a little bit. The first covenant, how did that happen and where did it happen? Sinai. In, at Sinai. And what, it hap what happened at Sinai? God spoke face. to them from the mountain. I mean, that certainly should have been impressive enough. And what did they said? Three times they said, and in fact, even before God spoke to them, 
whatever God says, we will do it. And what happened? They didn't do it. They had to and so then we have the second covenant. Where is that found? Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, where God says, I will do the placing of the, my law in your hearts and so forth and so forth. Um, so the law was the same. Yeah. The law didn't change. The law, law didn't change. He says, well, look, I'll put it in your heart. Yeah. I'll do it myself. How does it he didn't, do that? Well, he cannot do it against our will. That's the point. That's the point. So nothing really changed, did it? And nothing changed. Well, except yeah. that it's what free. changed. Yeah. Without freedom, yeah. <laughs> there's, God is love and you can't have love without freedom. What, what changed was in the first covenant, the people said, we'll do yeah, it. We'll do. In the second covenant, God says, I'll do it. That is, I'll work with you to do it for you. Oh, that's a better, much better explanation, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the, the results of this Daniel 8 and 9 prophecy. He recognized that the children of Israel had been evil and sinful, and that this is Daniel in his prayer, and had not held up their side of the covenant. They had agreed to with God. So Daniel 9, 20 to 25, Jim? <clears throat> I went on praying, confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel, and pleading with the Lord my God to restore his holy temple. While I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen to the earlier vision, came flying down to where I was. It was the time for the evening sacrifice to be offered. He explained, Daniel, I have come here to help you understand the prophecy. When you began to plead with God, he answered you. Uh, he loves you, and so do I have come to tell you the answer. Now pay attention while I explain the vision. And we're running out of time, so this, what comes as the next few verses, of what we've already talked about, what's going to happen. And then Ezra 7, 18, of course, is the, is the where they say, this was apparently the money used at least to start the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. So... Here, Gabriel finally answers Daniel's question and prayer about the restoration and the rebuilding of Jerusalem, God's holy mountain. And so the 2300 days takes us all the way down to what time? 1844. Almost in our day. And so at that time, God is going to bring this whole thing to a conclusion. Thus, the prophecy of the 70 weeks comes to an end with the 2300 years uh, down to 1844. Yeah, let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for this understanding we have that has carried the prophetic time down. I mean, we can't even figure out what's going to happen tomorrow to think that you can predict something 2,300 uh, years in advance just blows our minds. Lord, we're so thankful that you live outside of history in a sense that you can look forward, you can look backward. Forgive us when we have ever doubted your ability to care for us or to show us what is the right thing to do. May we follow you every day faithfully is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.